People welcomed the factories, because with factories moving in, we could earn some money and prosper. But then once the factories were here, people realized, our water's been polluted, we can't drink it. Our soil's been polluted and grain production has fallen. Our fruit trees have died of pollution. Our pigs have died, our sheep have died, and our people have died too, died of cancer. Then they thought, we don't want development like this, factories like these. At first we wanted money, but now we want quality of life. China's people are paying the price for her rapid economic growth. The prosperity touches some, the pollution touches all. The environmental challenge isn't just to provide our children with future happiness, but the real question of whether our generation can survive intact. This may be China's century. She's growing richer, growing stronger. And the process is taking her people through momentous upheavals. This television series has had exceptional access to the country, her institutions and people, at a critical time. This is China from the inside. Nature in China is becoming a battleground, contested by scientists, environmentalists, government, and ordinary people. 1.3 billion of them, whose water, air, and soil are at stake. Development creates human as well as environmental cost. Giant construction projects involve resettling people in new cities, uprooting millions from land, job, and home. There are places in China which remind us what it must all have once been like. When the rivers were at the center of daily life, when the water was clean enough to wash vegetables in. When the air was pure enough to dry meat safely. When taming nature meant using cormorants to catch fish. Yet the Chinese also have a long history of improving nature. Two and a half thousand years ago, they started building the Grand Canal, linking rivers and cities. By the 1950s, heavy industrialization was the priority. Chairman Mao Zedong urged the Chinese people to conquer nature thereby freeing themselves from it. Half a century later, China opens a new coal-fired power station every week of the year and emits more greenhouse gases than any country other than the United States. You can't solve the problem of poverty without economic development. But as you speed up economic development, you can't help but destroy the environment. To cultivate more land, you have to build roads, chop down forests. You have to do the same to build a factory. And with this kind of economic development, emissions of industrial waste and gases massively increase. As does human sewage, with the rise in population density and living standards. And so there's more and more pollution. Of the world's ten most polluted cities, five, unfortunately, are in China. 
Such severe pollution is undoubtedly a grave threat to the physical health of the Chinese people. The Huai River flows for over 600 miles across the middle of China, providing water for 150 million people. I was born on the banks of the Huai River. It was in 1987 that I grew worried about the problem of water pollution in the river. I'd gone back to take pictures of the scenery, but there no longer was any scenery. Instead, I found myself taking photos of people dredging up dead fish. Huo Daishan gave up his job as a news photographer to save the Huai. Research took him to its main tributary, the Sha Ying. Nearly half a million tons of human sewage a day are tipped into it, plus a million tons of untreated wastewater from paper mills, tanneries, chemical works. Some use processes banned elsewhere. Their effluents include ammonia, cyanide, arsenic. Water from this river has flowed through irrigation channels into villages and sunk into the ground. People who drank this polluted groundwater just became ill. The water of this river, the black and stinking water, takes death with it wherever it flows. It really is a river of death. Before, the local rate for cancer was one in a hundred thousand. Now in some villages it's one in a hundred. Cancer doesn't differentiate between age or gender. This cancer sufferer is one year old. Her grandfather, grandmother, father and mother have all died from tumours and cancers. She has cancer of the liver and has had an operation which left a deep scar. This woman had esophagus cancer and had an operation followed by chemotherapy. She lost all her hair. When I saw her, she was already beyond cure, was preparing for death and had put on her burial clothes. This is an esophagus cancer sufferer from Huangmangying village. Her name was Zhang Guizhi. The cancer had blocked her whole gullet. Not even a drop of water could get through. Shortly after I took this photo, she died. It's widely reported that because of Huai River pollution, there are cancer villages. But if you sue through the courts, the requirements for evidence are very strict. If you don't have this evidence, you might lose the case. And where the cause of illness is pollution, it's very difficult to gather evidence. So, say you've got a disease like stomach cancer or lung cancer, and you say it's caused by polluted water, it's extremely difficult to prove a causal connection between the two. Vice Minister Pan Yue does not need convincing of the link between people's health and their environment. Two million of our people die from cancer every year. We don't have accurate figures. We haven't done the sums. But many cancer cases are related to environmental pollution. But a booming economy is one of China's priorities, and the Environment Administration has limited power to hinder that. Our environmental law has tens of sections, but it stipulates that we can only play a supervisory role and don't have the power to shut down polluting companies. It's surprising that in all these sections we haven't been granted this authority. We don't